was telling Brother Ike, snow comes up further on short people than it does tall people. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> My wife was wanting me to knock the snow off of the top of the house. And I got out there, and I said, great day in the morning, this is hard work. I had a little old pole about 20 foot long, and I was trying to job. Oh, I said, we need a deacon. <laughs> one of them was sick and one of them was stuck. Okay, well, we'll get us some more, Lord willing, for long. And I can call them. Hey, man, won't that be a blessing? All right, I want to preach to you from the 26th chapter of the book of Acts. It's good to see everybody that's here. We thank you for coming. Some of you I know that, that uh, you put out some effort to come, and I pray that, that God would bless you for coming. And, and you could get something from the preaching that would help you. Acts chapter number 26 and verse 16. We'll, we'll go start there uh, when it, he had... This is Paul on the Damascus Road. And uh, he said, But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, they may receive the forgiveness of sins and the inheritance among them which are sanctified by a faith that is in me. Then Paul said, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles, the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. And they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. Shouldn't be any doubt if you're saved. There shouldn't be any doubt in people's mind there's been a change in you. Jesus will change you. If you haven't been changed, you haven't been saved. I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm trying to rescue you. If you haven't been changed, you haven't been saved. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day witnessing both to the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake, for he himself, Festus, said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. I've never been accused of being real smart and learned too much, but I have been called crazy. <laughs> and that's what the mad deal there is. Paul, you just know too much Bible. It's just absolutely driven you mad. Verse 25, he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing wasn't done in a corner. They didn't sneak off somewhere for Calvary. Amen. They didn't slip off and resurrect Jesus. Yeah, right. the, whole, the whole city knew what was Amen. going on. Amen. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And I wanted to preach on, on witnessing. And I wanted to show by this that even as great a soul winner as the Apostle Paul didn't win them all. Amen. 
but he did witness to all of them. Jesus said, if you'll follow me, I'll make you to be fishers of men. Now, if you've ever been fishing, you know you don't catch them all. But you can catch some of them. Have you been trying? Have you been wanting to witness to people? I want to give you, I, I was touched, I think, on this in both sermons on Sunday. I want to give you some, some ideas about witnessing to people and how to do it. Are you saved? Amen. If, if, if you're saved, uh, you want other people to be saved. Amen. Well, how do we go about it? I think Paul is a good example of how we ought to go about it. And just remember that the results is up to God. But God uses you and I as witnesses for Him. And it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. God uses preaching to save people. Amen. Preach to them. You don't have to preach from a pulpit. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You wouldn't even necessarily have to be a man. Yeah. <laughs> you would to exercise this pulpit authority. Right. But out there on the road, you can witness to somebody. Yeah. Amen. And I want, I want to talk about that. Our Father... Thank you today for the privilege, oh, just the privilege to pray. God, I, I ask you now that you'd help me that, that my uh, weaknesses and frailties would not show through, but, Lord, that the love of God would be shed abroad in our heart. And, Father, we could bring people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So if we would go back to the, the time when Paul started out. Paul and, and Barnabas were members of the First Baptist Church of Antioch. They're in Syria. And the Holy Ghost called them to leave that place, separated them, and moved them about 200 miles up to Antioch, which is in Pisidia. Same, ta same name, a different town. And as they would go into the synagogue, the evident custom of that day would be that they would open the Bible and they would read from the Scripture and then somebody would say, has anybody got any light on this thing? Does anybody know what we're talking about? And Paul said, I do. I got some light on the teachings about the tabernacle. I know what that shed blood of that lamb is all about. Uh, and he began, he began with a rehearsal of the entire history of the nation of Israel. He began with the choosing of their fathers and finished with the resurrection, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And he warned his nation. He warned the Jews. That's who he started with. That's who the gospel started with. But he warned his nation of the, do not underestimate the judgment and the severity of God. You are hanging over hell on a rotten rail and you don't even realize. Amen. Do not underestimate uh, uh, that God uh, uh, bound his Son, Jesus, uh, uh, and he will bind all that reject Jesus. Amen. When the formal meeting was over there, uh, there was uh, uh, interested people. And most of the time there will be. Whenever you come to church, you know, people are interested in getting to Shoney's or wherever. <laughs> yeah. But if you can get a, a motley crew together somewhere, uh, like, say, the rescue mission or the jailhouse. And I've preached in both of them. And most of the time, whenever they hear some preaching, because they don't hear preaching today. Amen. They hear pep talks and psychology classes, Amen. but they don't hear the preaching of the Word of God. Amen. And when they're exposed to the preaching, Jew or Gentile, <laughs> they desire to hear more. Yeah. And so they came to Paul and persuaded uh, uh, them by the grace of God and 
and he persuaded them. His witnessing was by simply opening his mouth and speaking to the Jews. He used the Bible. And this is where people make mistakes today, trying to talk to these heathen pagans from the Bible. They don't know the Bible. They have no idea what the Bible is. But the logic of talking with the, anybody that's acquainted with the Scripture, that's the place to start. Amen. If they're acquainted with it at all, if maybe somewhere back in their lifetime when they were a little boy or girl in Sunday school, maybe somebody told them some Bible. If they're acquainted with the Bible, but the sad fact is that we've thrown the Bible out of our society and people are not even acquainted with what it says. In Acts 17, he set forth the preeminence and necessity of a blood atonement. And that blood was shed and that the, the uh, uh, graves and death and hell could not hold the Lamb of God that shed his blood. Amen. Jews wanted to contradict that. They still do. Yeah. They wouldn't dare invite me to that B'nai B'rith synagogue down there on California Avenue. If I'd go in there, they'd be hollering, Charleston, police arrest this guy. They still contradict the evidence, refute plain evidence of their own scripture. It's their Bible. I didn't write it. No Gentile wrote it. It's wrote by the Jewish people. The oracles of God were given to the Jewish people. And the Jewish people reject their own scripture. When dealing with those who know the scripture, the worker must present to them that scripture is talking about Jesus. You understand that? The preeminence of Jesus. We've got three kings that that reign in the scripture over all Israel. The first one's Saul. The second one's David. And the third one is Solomon. And I believe I can take the whole history of the world and put them in those three kings. The first king, Saul, he reigned 40 years. And the Bible said that David reigned 40 years. And then a lot of people don't know it, but 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 42, Solomon reigned 40 years. 40 is a number of testify, a number of testing. And so the first king saw is 40 years a picture of the flesh in control. And most of our lives, wouldn't you agree, till we got saved, the flesh was in control. The flesh was in charge. And it's the reign of the flesh and the reign of sin. And it just reigns over us as it reigned over Saul. A man starts out in glory and he winds up in witchcraft. Well, amen. amen. The man knew God. But when he knew God, he glorified him not as God, amen. but became Vain in his imagination, his foolish heart was darkened and professing himself to be wise, he became a fool. And that's exactly what happened to everybody that allows the flesh to reign in their life. Amen. You'll end up a fool. Yeah. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Yeah. Then I think about the second man. Uh, uh, well, let me go on with the first one. There is a culture in our world today, a culture of sin. Amen. And that culture is down and not up. Yeah. It's not evolution, it's devolution. Amen. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar is a good example of a man that thought himself to be something when he was nothing. What happens to people who think themselves to be nothing, something when they're nothing? What happened to Rome? What happened to Greece? You ever go down South Charleston, down D Street? Do you ever wonder what happened to mound builders? Where are they? Where did they go to? They went the same path that Saul went. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, and they wound up being in witchcraft. The process is going on. 
in America today. We were started as a great nation under the fear of God, but paganism has taken over and wickedness and hell and all, all nations that forget God will go to hell, the Bible said. Forty years the flesh was in charge. That forty years he tested and found up a big zero. The second man is David. And actually, if you'll find most of his history is the king in rejection. He, amen. That's what we've got today as Christians. We've got a king that's been rejected. As long as the flesh reigns, the king is rejected. But I read in this scripture where the king is calling out some people that will not reject him. Come outside of the camp. Come to the cave of Adula. A picture of the church age and the promise of the grace of God that though he's been rejected by the world, as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. It was sad enough that Saul persecuted David, but in later years, even his own little boy wanted to run him away from the throne. And I'm saying that Jesus is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief, and we hide our faces from him. We did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. I think Absalom's a picture of the closing days of the church and the apostasy of the church that wants to take Jesus off the throne. Yeah, amen. amen. And wants to put the movement or the pastor or whatever yeah, that they want to put on the throne. Yeah. I want to say, hey, listen, God will not share his glory with another. Yeah. Don't you ever try to put me on the throne. I don't belong on the throne. I belong in hell. But thank God, by the grace of God and the blood of Jesus Christ, I'm going to reign one day. Solomon reigned 40 years. And it's interesting that he never fought a battle. You check me out. Look it up in the scripture. Solomon had a peaceful reign all the time he was there. Never had to go out to battle. And Paul used these scriptures. And he used them to persuade people that knew the scriptures. Now Paul persuaded the Gentiles with a different Different uh, attitude altogether. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Can you do that for just a minute? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm terrible at sword drills, so you'll probably beat me there. Verse number 10, for we all, now he's, he's talking about Christians here. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest to your conscience. You see, you may not know nothing about the Bible, but God has implanted in every son and daughter of Adam a conscience. And that conscience can distinguish, quote, right from wrong. You don't have to be a Christian. To know that stealing's wrong. Would you agree with that? And I think uh, some people say, well, that's my seat. Well, who authorized you to claim a seat? But people will say, you took my seat and that's wrong. Am I telling it right? Amen. Amen. 
we live in a day of civil rights. The black people says, I got a right. The queer people say, I got a right. Well, who authorized your rights? I know who the founding fathers of this country attributed the rights to. Am I telling it correctly when I say Thomas Jefferson said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. So if you've got a right, a real right comes from God. It doesn't come from the the Supreme Court passing a law that says two queers can get married. That's not a a right. That's a wrong. Rights come from God. I don't want to get in on that Oregon thing, but the way I understand it, and you hear this off off of the news, you don't hear this. But the way I understand it, those men have been grazing cattle on that place for hundreds of years. And the government comes in and says, we're going to make a national park. And if you don't do what the government says, they'll kill you. God is the author of rights. and Violation of the rights that God gives us are wrong. God reveals himself to man in those rights. God explains the things you can't see by the things you can see. The imprint of God is on everything that you look around. Uh, God is a trinity. And God's work with His fingers uh, just shows up in the heaven. God shows up in you. You've got a body, you've got a soul, and you've got a spirit. A three of you. Amen. Just like they three in the, in the uh, uh, trinity of God. You've got a family. Let me help you. A family is supposed to consist of three. That is a father and a mother and children. Amen. Amen. You've got a a, a, a measurement of space. You've got length and you've got width and you've got depth. You've got time. You've got past, present, and future. It's all laid out in a series of three. You got a problem. You got a physical problem, an emotional problem, a mental problem. I got all three of them. And so are some of you. You got a yes, a no, and a maybe. Paul persuaded the Jews using the scripture. And I say persuade people that haven't been exposed to the Bible use the Bible. But if they've not been exposed to the Bible, you just take them out there and let them look at the stars. Heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament shows His handiwork. You take them out there and you you just go through some of those things I told you. The invisible things of Him are clearly seen by the things that He's made. And you apply to that conscience. And you say, do you know right from wrong? Well, They'll say, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, relative. But then you say, if somebody come in your house and pitched you out the door and claimed your possessions, would that be right or wrong? <laughs> Unless you've got an emotional, mental case, they'll say it's wrong for you to take my stuff. Right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> And you know that that works right on down, right on down to the deathbed. They'll lay there on that deathbed. And they may be so hardened against God that you can't witness to them about the scripture. But you just witness to them about are you ready? Are you prepared to meet God? If tonight was the last night on earth, the plans you got made, would you carry them out? I don't know, the snow may have held them up. But Batesville Coffin Company may have unloaded your casket down at Fiddler and Frame or Stevens and Grass or Elk Funeral Home or a dozen others around here. But 
I'm not saying they have, but I'm saying one day they will. And when that day comes, God will purge your conscience. But your conscience can only be purged with the blood of Jesus. And once the blood of Jesus is applied to your conscience, you can say, and I hate to quote the man, but I'll go ahead and quote him. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. Free at last. Let's bow for prayer. You won't win them all. Agrippa almost made it in. But he didn't make it. He almost did. But I believe there will be multitudes of people in heaven. Because they were not only almost. But altogether persuaded. That Jesus Christ. Is the only begotten son of God. That died on the cross for their sin was buried and the third day rose again ascended into glory and he's coming back he's prepared a place and he's coming for a prepared people are you prepared tonight